And let's open with prayer. Father, we commit this conference to you for each one who's here, for those who are watching via live stream, and for those who will see this uh, on YouTube. We pray your blessing upon this, upon each speaker and each person here, that we would all be blessed by uh, the teaching of your word, and that your spirit would work in both the speakers and the listeners. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of my message today is Don't Let Anything Other Than Scripture Determine Your Beliefs and Determine Your Practices. Now, I would think, speaking to a believing audience, that this should be like, duh, right? This should be like, obviously, the only thing we allow to determine what we believe and what we practice, at least in terms of uh, the Christian life, is found in the Word of God. Um, yet, that's not what most professing Christians do. Most professing Christians are influenced by far more than the Word of God, both in terms of what they believe and in terms of what they do. In fact, I would suggest that their primary influence are other factors, and the Bible is somewhere relegated down to second, third, fourth, fifth, it's much lesser importance than other factors. And let me see what I have here. So don't let something other than Scripture determine your beliefs and practices. People are often influenced by impressions, right? People have an impression from God, and they think God guided them with some sort of impression. Many people are guided by church history, whether these are creeds, whether these are councils, whether these are uh, decrees by popes uh, or by the head of the Orthodox Church, or whether this is by your favorite theologian of the past, Luther, Calvin, or maybe your favorite theologian today. But people put a lot of stock in church history and what church history says. A third area is experience. I can hardly overestimate uh, the influence of experience in the guidance of most people who are professing Christians. Most people base their testimony on experience, not the Word of God. Most people evangelize based on their experience, not based on the Word of God. Most people base their understanding of discipleship on their experience, not by the Word of God. Most people are guided by their experiences, and their experiences are a key factor, and they will tell you this. Now, they don't mean to be saying, um, by the way, my experience trumps Scripture, but that's actually what happens. The opposite should be true, right? We should evaluate our experiences in light of Scripture rather than evaluating the Scriptures in light of our experiences. But the latter is what is commonly done. And the fourth is reason. A lot of people say things like, it wouldn't make sense to me if God did this. It wouldn't make sense to me if this were true. It's unreasonable that this would happen. And so what they're doing is they're saying, it really doesn't matter what the Bible says, because my reason has already informed me that this other thing can't be true, or this thing must be true. So let's take a look at these issues here. How about a, a word or an impression from God? You may be familiar with the fact that Joseph Smith actually didn't start out to uh, have a cult. Well, maybe he did, but he was actually from a Baptist uh, background, as I recall. And he came up with this idea that he could have a new religion with lots of followers. And his new religion had the idea that people would be able to receive direct revelation from God, right? He had all kinds of direct revelation from God. And as he told his followers, you can have revelations from God. And, and that has been uh, uh, very popular. Now, there's a famous story about uh, two brothers called the Lafferty brothers. And the Lafferty brothers were, uh, I believe, fundamentalist Mormons, the more conservative uh, Mormons. And their sister-in-law, they felt, was not being duly submissive to her husband. Uh, 
She had a small child. She and her husband had a small child. And they believed literally and sincerely that God told them to go and take their sister-in-law's life. And it had to be a blood sacrifice. It wasn't just kill her. You had to shed her blood because in Mormonism, shedding of blood is a way to cleanse the land. And so they went out and they killed her uh, by shedding her blood. And they went to trial and they said, well, we didn't do anything wrong. God told us to do this. That was their defense. And they're both in prison for life. Well, did they really believe what they were doing was the will of God? Yes, they did. But it was obviously wrong. And we all say, well, how silly is that? But how many people have picked a seminary because they believe God told me to go to that seminary? They picked a spouse because God told me to marry this person or somebody else told me that God told them that I'm supposed to marry so-and-so, right? That happens a lot. Or, you know, I'm supposed to move because this prophet told me I'm supposed to do this or that or the other. And they end up and they're led by impressions and for things uh, like that. Many evangelicals, not just Pentecostals, not just Charismatics, and not just Third Wave believe that God speaks to them today. There are lots of Calvinists who believe that God speaks to them. And uh, this type of uh, experience can lead people to be guided by these impressions or things they think they've heard as opposed to Scripture because this becomes more important. Many of you here remember Dr. James Dobson, right? Uh, he used to be uh, out of Arcadia, California, where I grew up. And then they moved to Colorado Springs, and now he's no longer the head of Focus on the Family. But I remember when his dad had a massive, I believe it was a stroke, and nearly died. And after that, his dad made a recovery, and I think he lived another six months to a year. But during that time, Dr. Dobson was on the radio and he said, I've got some great news for all of you. And I'm thinking, what's the great news? He says, you all know my dad had this massive stroke and nearly died. But when he was going through all this, God spoke to him. And God told him he was going to persevere and he was guaranteed he was going to heaven. And I am so happy to know my dad's for sure going to be in heaven. Now, the basis, he believed he was eternally secure from that point until the time he died. Was it because of scripture? No. It was because God supposedly gave him some revelation. When I came to faith in college, my senior year in college, I, I, was, I ran track that year, and one of my fellow guys on the track team joined the Campus Crusade for Christ or the Athletes in Action Bible Study. And we were going through the security of the believer. And this guy was a charismatic. And I remember talking to him, and he said, oh yeah, I believe I'm eternally secure. And I said, I thought you believed people could lose their salvation. He said, well, they can. I said, well, how could you possibly be sure? He said, oh, God told me I won't fall away. I'm guaranteed I won't fall away. And so I'm going to make it. Well, he's not basing his faith on the word of God. He's basing it on some supposed message that he heard from God. Now, if we look at special revelation in the Old Testament, prophetic messages, or in the New Testament, either through the scriptures or through those who had the gift of prophecy. That's the exception, not the rule. It's never been normal in the history of God's people that God is giving revelation to everyone. And I am convinced that based on the scriptures, special revelation ceased with the end of the uh, New Testament canon, with the possible exception that you know, the Lord Jesus did appear to the apostle Paul, Saul at that time, on the road to Damascus. Uh, and, uh, of course, he did appear to Stephen as Stephen's dying. He sees him uh, in heaven. And it's possible the Lord could have appeared to people uh, over the course of church history. But as far as special revelation where we're getting more scripture, no, we're not getting that. And that is not something we get today. So impressions should not be guiding us.
And if you've ever tried to talk with someone who's had an experience, take, for example, speaking in tongues. Well, if they've spoken in tongues, then it's in most cases impossible to convince them because they'll tell you, I've done it. I've experienced it. Now, I know people who did it, experienced it, and came to see that it wasn't biblical and stopped doing it. But that, too, is the exception rather than the rule. If you talk to a professing Christian who says homosexuality is just an alternate way that God has made people and that this is perfectly fine, uh, Scripture's not going to get in their way because they have a conviction based on what's reasonable to, to them. Now, why the Scriptures alone must guide our... Oh, this is the second one. The church history and, uh, and tradition. Catholics and Orthodox have their councils. They have their creeds. The Protestants have the Westminster Confession of Faith, the Synod of Dort. Uh, Baptists have uh, the London Confession, the Baptist Faith and Message, all kinds of things. I remember I presented a brown bag at Dallas Theological Seminary in around 2005, and I was uh, speaking about free grace issues and the fact that we're saved by grace through faith apart from works and that perseverance is neither required nor guaranteed. And afterwards, a student came up and he said, you know, what you said today contradicted 500 years of Christian scholarship. And my response to him was, first of all, why pick 500? Why don't we go for 2,000? Right? If we're going for 2,000, wouldn't we all be either Orthodox or Roman Catholic? But secondly, if we're taking the last 500 years, Calvinism is a very tiny stream alongside the great rivers that are Catholicism, Orthodoxy, and Arminianism. Catholic is just a little narrow sliver. So it's being hypocritical to say, I'm going contrary to 500 years of church history. You're going contrary to 500 years of church history if you're a Calvinist. Because you see, church history doesn't tell us what's true. Church history raises options, right? It's kind of like saying, I went to a church and I heard the pastor say something. Well, okay, fine. How many churches are on the planet today? How many flavors of Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant, and every other, uh, you know, denomination or ism or wasm uh, are there? There are untold thousands. And uh, the fact that you hear someone say something doesn't make it true whether they're today or whether they're 500 years ago or 1,000 years ago or 1,500 years ago or whether they're from early in the second century. It doesn't prove what is right. The scriptures prove what is right. Second uh, Timothy 3.16, if you have your Bibles, turn there. I'll be right back. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, Paul says, All Scripture is inspired by God. That's the Greek word theopneustos, God-breathed, and is profitable for reproof, for correction, for teaching, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Well, what this verse is suggesting is that we need to be in the Word of God. Uh, before we get there, I got a, a little bit ahead. Let me talk about reason and experience together, how people are influenced by that. Many people decide what's true based on either their reason or their experience. For example, I recently read a comment from someone on social media who said, I believe it would be unjust for God to condemn anybody to an eternity in hell if they never heard about Jesus before they died. Well, that's a view, but it's not based on scripture. He's not saying, I have this scripture or that scripture that suggests it. In fact, what he's suggesting goes contrary to the word of God, but he's using reason to do that. At our 2006 annual conference, 
uh, and you can check out uh, on YouTube a message by Bob Bryant where he revisited that conference. We had a, a message by Zane Hodges and a message by Bob Bryant on assurance being of the essence of saving faith, meaning that at the moment of faith, a person believes in Jesus for an irrevocable life, an irrevocable salvation. That you, it's not enough to believe that I'm saved for now. You have to believe I'm saved forever. And on Wednesday afternoon, we had a kind of rap session. This was our biggest conference ever. We had 360 people, and almost everybody was at this rap session. And theoretically, we were going to go over all the talks the first three days of the conference. Instead, all we talked about was what Bob Bryant and Zane Hodges said. And finally, at one point, it was pretty clear that a large percentage of the people in the audience were convinced they were born again before they believed they were secure. In other words, they didn't buy what Zane Hodges or Bob Bryant were saying. So I said, why don't, let's just have a show of hands. How many here believe you were born again before you believed in the doctrine that you were eternally secure simply by faith in Christ? About half the people raised their hands. I was shocked. I'm like, really? And then how many? And then the other half raised their hands. Well, what ended up and happened is that next year we had about 160 people at our annual conference because the other 180 left and haven't come back. They're what Mike Lee calls flexible free grace. And that's, that was the birth of flexible free grace. Well, it, it existed long before, but it's where they came out. <laughs> it's where they, they identified it as their position. But you know, the funny thing is, after the, a month after the conference, one of the people who is one of our main speakers spoke at another conference, this one in Houston, and he said that you don't need to believe that what you get is eternal. And in the course of the question and answer time, he said that he was born again five years before he knew he was secure. And by the way, his whole argument in the paper was that if you have to believe in the security of the believer in order to be born again, then nobody was born again between 100 A.D. and 1519. Because he somehow knows that nobody believed in the security of the believer for those 1,419 years, 1,420 years. So I contacted him, sent him an email and said, hey, can we get together and talk about what you said about your testimony? And he said, sure. So there was another conference in Dallas at this time of year in October. And I went and met with him. And I said to him, so you said you were born again five years before you believed you were secure. He said, right. I said, well, how did you know that? I mean, looking back on it, wouldn't you say, well, I don't know if I was born again then or not, because I didn't believe John 3.16, right? I didn't believe John 5.24. I didn't believe Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And he said, oh, well, you're not going to like this, Bob, but the way I knew it is because my life radically changed. He said, I stopped cussing instantly. No, desire, no effort, no nothing. Just stopped cussing. And I had no interest in the Bible before that moment. Suddenly I had a voracious appetite for the Bible. Well, I didn't tell him. I didn't want to argue with him. But I thought, well, can't God work in the life of an unbeliever? Can't give God motivate an unbeliever to love the Bible? To stop drinking? To stop smoking? To stop sleeping around? And, and yet they're still not born again until they believe whatever the saving message is. But his point was, I can't remember what he said, when he accepted Jesus or invited Jesus in or whatever it was, at that point he was born again and he knew it because his life changed. Well, that's basing your theology on your experience. And what I found is a lot of the flexible free grace people, the reason they say that Lordship Salvation people are born again is because they came to faith under a Lordship Salvation message. Of course, they didn't really come to faith, mind you, but they came to the Lordship Salvation position under Lordship Salvation. Later, they came to believe the promise of life and were born again 
But since they're already convinced based on their experience, they were born again back here. Now when they evangelize, they evangelize the way their experience was, not based on this, because they consider uh, the promise of eternal security to be an unnecessary addition to the saving message. And, and so it's problematic. So in terms of what I was talking about, why the scriptures alone, because it's scripture and all scripture that's profitable for reproof, for correction, for te teaching and training in righteousness. And by the way, he talks about the man of God here. And uh, this is important. I've got two quotes, one from uh, Knight in his commentary on the pastoral epistles. And he says, but it seems more likely that Paul is contemplating scripture as a whole here. Not each and every scripture, but all the totality of scripture. And that he would say the whole of scripture is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness, than that every scripture passage is profitable in these ways. It is also more likely that he would say that the whole of scripture equips the man of God than that every passage does so. This understanding would also be in accord with his usage of the term in its collective sense in the phrase scripture says, and would be more likely here since no specific passage is cited. Now look, Knight could be wrong. And obviously, if all of scripture is used by God and profitable by God, then therefore every passage is a building block too, right? So I think there's some exaggeration in what he's saying. But I also agree with the basic thrust of what he's saying is that people need the whole counsel of God's word. We need all scripture, not just some selective scripture. How many Bible churches today never preach or teach out of the Old Testament? How many Bible churches today have never seen the four gospels? How many Bible churches today have never seen the book of Revelation? I mean, lots. You remember the... Uh, the preacher's wife, uh, Whitney Houston, right? And she was talking about her dad was a pastor, and he said he preached all the happy verses in the Bible, <laughs> and he just left out all the bad verses because that didn't work well for his congregation. We laugh, but that's what goes on in a lot of churches today is because they're looking to tickle the ears, which is what Paul told Timothy was going to happen in the last days that people would accumulate for themselves teachers that would say what they wanted them to say rather than to teach what the Word of God says. Uh, Luke Johnson, uh, in his commentary, says concerning the expression man of God, especially in the narrative portions of Scripture, the title Anthropos to Theu is given, that, that's man of God, is given to special representatives of God like the prophets and preeminently the prophet Moses. Given the analogy between Moses and the magicians in 2 Timothy 3, 8 and 9, it is particularly apposite, or that word apposite means apt, it's particularly apt designation. Compare servant of the Lord in 2, 24. Of course, Timothy was being addressed, and Timothy was a man of God. He was not an apostle, but he was a delegate of an apostle. And nothing else should be guiding men of God, women of God, believers in Jesus Christ, other than all Scripture. We shouldn't be guided by impressions or feelings or emotions or what seems reasonable to us or what church history has said. It doesn't mean we don't, you know, put any stock in any of these things. But what it means is all of those things have to submit to the bar of Scripture. All of those things have to fall. If my experience contradicts Scripture, well, then I realize that my experience is wrong. I myself invited Jesus into my heart hundreds of times before I was born again. And one of them, I felt a little liver quiver when I was 16. So when I went to the Campus Crusade guy at age 20, I told him I needed assurance. And so he kept harping on Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Well, when I finally got it, you know what I realized? 
I had never believed that before, and I didn't say, you know what, I was born again when I was 16 and had the liver quiver, and then at 20, that's when I got the extra blessing. No, I, I realized I was born again at 20, and when I started giving my testimony, that's the way I give it. But I can't tell you how many people say, when I was such and so, I came to faith in Christ, but I didn't know where I was going when I died, and then five years later, 10 years later, I heard about the promise of everlasting life, and I got the added blessing. And so they're sharing a, a confusing message with people. If anything overrides scripture, well then it seems to me we're not guided by the word of God, but by something else. If you think about scripture, think about Psalm 119, 176 verses, and almost every single one has some synonym for the word of God. Thy law, thy testimonies, thy counsel, etc. And it's all about the word of God. In Psalm 40, verse 8, I mean, I mean Isaiah 40 and verse 8, we're told that God's word abides forever. Uh, in Matthew 24, Jesus said, Well, heaven and earth will pass away. My words will never pass away. There will be a day when heaven and earth will pass away. Second Peter chapter 3, we're going to get a new heaven and a new earth, Revelation 21 and 22. But Jesus' word will never pass away. It's eternal. Now, I find that uh, flexible free grace people understand what a person must do to have eternal life or to be saved with three factors influence them. Number one is their experience. When they came to faith, they didn't know they were eternally secure, so nobody else needs to. Number two, their reason. You can see it in their writings. They reason that it would be unfair of God to condemn anybody to hell who believed in the deity of Christ, the death of Christ, and the resurrection of Christ. If you believe in DDR, deity, death, resurrection, you're getting in. Not that we have any scripture that says that, but that's reasonable to them, or it would be unreasonable to condemn them on a little technicality like believing that they'll never perish and they have everlasting life. And then the third influence is church history. As I mentioned, there was this paper written about from 100 to 1500, and it was repeated in a book charging Zane Hodges and me and Bob Bryant and Grace Evangelical Society with heresy. And he repeated the same argument that nobody would have been born again during that time, which is a silly argument because there's always been a remnant of people born again, and we have no idea what people believe between 100 and 1519. Most people never wrote anything. And of the people who wrote, if you weren't Calvinist or Orthodox, they're not likely to preserve your manuscripts. In fact, they're likely to destroy them as heretical if they find them. Uh, and so I believe that this flexible free grace position, although it's well-intentioned, it's not focused on scripture. That's why it's not called focused free grace, but it's looking at other things. Here are a few examples that uh, sometimes cause focus free grace people to become flexible free grace. And I think I've got this here, let me see. There they are, those are the three things. And number one, they might accept arguments that are based on experience. They'll hear someone talk about it, and so they will do that. Um, and they might be influenced by writers and speakers who are charming and have a lot of charisma. And they might join a Bible study or a discipleship group or a church that is promoting a mild form of lordship salvation and say, well, these are wonderful believers, uh, th this must not be a problem. Uh, and, so, and sometimes, you know, it's, there's uh, an issue where people will avoid naming names, they will avoid talking about labels like Lordship Salvation or whatever, but the problem with that is what happens when someone goes out from your assembly and they have to move and they don't know anything about any of these labels. They're possibly going to be picked off. Paul didn't seem to have problems naming Hymenaeus and Alexander or Hymenaeus and Philetus or talking about the Judaizers. Freedom from slavery to sin only comes from the word of God. Let's close with uh, John 8, 30 through 32. Take a look there.
Martin Luther King Jr. used the ending portion of this in his I've Got a Dream speech, and it is a wonderful sentiment, and it does have application beyond what the Lord's talking about here. But notice John 8, 30 through 32. And uh, as he spoke these things, many believed in him. By the way, this isn't many profess to believe in him. This is John saying many believed in him. John 3, 16 means many were guaranteed they'd never perish, but they have everlasting life. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. So to be a follower of Christ, a learner of Christ, you need to abide in his word. And if you do abide in his word, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Set you free from what? If you read the verses that follow, they say we've never been in bondage to anything. And Jesus said to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. Jesus' point here is if you abide in Jesus' word, you will be set free from slavery to sin. The truth will set you free. That's the same message you get in Romans chapter 6, that we're no longer slaves of sin in our position, but now if we reckon ourselves dead to sin and yield our members to righteousness, then we will experience freedom from sin's bondage in, in our daily lives. And, and by the way, this is brought out by everything that follows after this. So the word of God is powerful and nothing else should guide our beliefs. Nothing else should guide our practices. Anything we think might be true, we need to check against the bar of scripture. And I would urge every one of us to have some mentor that you can go to and say, so what about this? I'm sorry that Zane Hodges is gone because I would call him all the time <laughs> to ask him questions, right? And I have friends that I talk about and interact with uh, on things like this because we all need people who are going to help us in our study of the Word of God. But it's all about the Word. Well, we've got uh, about eight minutes for questions or comments. So if you have a question or comment, let me know. Yeah, that's a good question. How can we get a flexible free grace person to be a focused free grace person? Uh, I notice a lot of people try this in social media, uh, and it, it doesn't, so far I haven't seen it working real well, because what happens is the flexible free grace people push back and say, you're being divisive, um, you, you're being uh, pugnacious, you're, you're argumentative, you're, you're not loving, and, and this sort of thing. Um, but, um, yeah, my suggestion would be certainly pray for them. I do pray for many of the leaders in the uh, flexible free grace movement that God would work in their hearts. That's a key factor. Another thing is keep on having an influence. In other words, when I'm writing blogs, when I'm doing little videos, etc., I'm not only hope, hoping to reach the people in the choir who already agree, I'm hoping to reach people who disagree, including flexible free grace people. And, and some of them will come around. Uh, I haven't heard stories like that uh, yet. I've heard lots of Arminians that have come to the focus free grace position, lots of Calvinists that have come to the focus free grace position. I guess you, they probably would have been flexible, free grace, they just didn't know the term, right? But in terms of the people who solidly identify with that, I'm not seeing it yet, but I would say pray for them. And if you have opportunity to talk with them, do so in a way that is loving and that is recognizing that, hey, uh, you're not going to come around unless you see it in the scriptures. So, you know, uh, we can talk about the scriptures, but I don't want to talk about your experience. I don't want to talk about church history. You know, I don't want to f f talk about impressions you've had. I want to talk about the Bible. If you want to talk about the Bible, I think we can make some, some progress. All right, we got a break then till 720 to 25, somewhere in there. And Philippe, you'll be up next. And he's speaking on free grace in the Old Testament, followed by Bob Bryant speaking on how to lead people to Christ.